What's going on, everybody? Happy Saturday. Welcome in to an all-new episode of the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You guys are the absolute freaking best. Appreciate you guys being here. Great show lined up for you today. We are going to be going over just about the nerdiest possible topic that you could ever imagine, and I could not be more thrilled about it. More on that in just a moment. Just a few notes from Friday, nothing too crazy. I think we were expecting to hear about Packers in Brazil uh, through the course of the week. That was sort of the expectation going into the week. And as we heard from Mark Murphy and, uh, you know, basically their thought process was that we would hear something by the end of the week. We didn't, at least not by the end of the work week. I don't know. I guess maybe Saturday or Sunday is when we will hear. However, however, on Friday, there was a late report from ESPN Brazil that the Packers are not the favorites to play in Brazil, meaning it sounds like some of the logistical issues that Mark Murphy talked about has probably moved Green Bay maybe down the list of expected favorites a little bit. It's, it's still two teams. It's Cleveland and Green Bay, but it seems to be leaning in the direction of the Cleveland Browns. As I'm recording this, nothing definitive as of yet, but the arrow seems to be pointing in that direction. Now, who knows? We could easily get an update in the next couple of days that it is Green Bay and it's not Cleveland, but as of a report from ESPN Brazil, again, on Friday, it does sound like it is leaning towards Eagles, Browns. We're just going to have to kind of wait and see until they make that final announcement. Meanwhile, Ken Ingles posting good news from the salary cap front. The Packers received a $1.4 million salary cap benefit in 2024, another half million in 2025 and in 2026 on an insurance policy that paid off for both David Bakhtiari and Jair Alexander. So they're recouping a little bit of that money that they paid in previously. They now get that money back and they get some salary cap space back. Nothing major. You know, you're talking about, you know, two and a half million dollars here. Nothing too crazy. But these things add up. They add up very, very fast. So when you're taking out insurance policies on players like that, this is what it's for. And you want some of that stuff to pay off. And Green Bay, uh, it paid off for them. And they now get some salary cap space back. Certainly not all of the recovery that they lost specifically in the Bakhtiari situations, but you'll take every little bit that you can get. And uh, thankfully for Green Bay, they did get a little bit back. So that is good news for the salary cap for this year and next year. And then from a NFL standpoint, Hassan Reddick traded to the New York Jets. Third round pick, future third round pick that could turn into a second round pick dependent upon how well he plays. My only really take here is that he's out of the conference. Certainly it helps Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets. That Reddick is going to the Jets. They sort of did a swap. Bryce Huff goes to the Eagles and Reddick goes to uh, the Jets. And then, of course, there's the real swap as well, where uh, the Eagles are actually getting draft compensation for this. But good for the Jets. It's a really good player. He's a little bit older, 30 years old, but he's been dominant in, you know, the last handful of seasons. And I have no doubt that he's still going to be able to play at a high level with New York this season. So good pickup for New York. And, uh, you know, Philly planned for his absence. They got Nolan Smith last year in the draft. They have plenty of defensive players on that front and then just went out and got uh, Bryce Huff from the Jets as well. So they're going to be just fine, but you don't necessarily hate seeing Hassan Reddick outside of the conference either. And last but not least, uh, we had OTA and minicamp schedule that was officially announced. So first day of workouts, like offseason workouts for Green Bay is April 15th. Uh, But the actual OTA practices will be May 20th, May 21st, May 23rd, May 28th, May 29th, May 31st, June 3rd, June 4th, and June 6th. And then that mandatory mini camp practice where everyone has to attend is June 11th through the 13th. So that's the mandatory mini camp. Now on Packers.com, they did say there's been nothing announced as to whether or not uh, any practices will be open to the public. I really hope that they open at least one or two practices, just even one back open to the public. They were not, none of the OTAs or mini camps were open a season ago. These were one of the things that I always told people training camp gets all the buzz, gets all the buzz, but those mini camps are usually your first chance as a fan to go and get a look at the rookie class, any of the free agents. And yes, there's no pads. It's not super high intensity, but it's still really, really fun. And you get to see all those guys. And one of my favorite aspects of it, when they did open it to the public previously, is it was a lot more toned down than a training camp practice. At a training camp practice, they are busy. They are hectic. And there's a lot of people there usually. And it's, you know, you've got the the dream drive and it's it's got all this stuff going on. 
previously when it was open to the public, it was just mini camp and it was a much sparser crowd. And I loved going to those as a fan and you just got to see the players and it wasn't as chaotic. And I always recommend it. I hope they open it up again. If they do open it up again, highly, highly recommend you going. Now, I suppose if I tell everyone to go, it's no longer maybe going to have that. Uh, you know, and actually if everyone goes, it's not going to have that same quaint atmosphere, but Still, they are amazing to go to, and there's no reason for the Packers not to open up at least one of the mini camp practices to the fans. This is a team that prides itself on being owned by the fans. Like, pay them back in some ways, and these are the easy ways to do so. Open up at least one of the mini camps to fans. It's not like, again, the any play that you're practicing on June 11th is going to show up in the it, You know what? When Big B's posting videos of plays from training camp, and it was a big you know, to do on, you know, the Packers and social media and everything like that. Do you think the 49ers Packers game, any like that had any bearing on it whatsoever? Like we got to make this stuff a little bit more accessible to fans. And I think the NFL actually needs to do a better job of stepping in and saying these, you like, you need to have mandatory practices that are open to the public. And these are the things that they can do This still needs to be a sport. And I know that the NFL is not a dying sport. I know that it just continues to raise in popularity, but you still want to cultivate the fans' interest. And the more that you can do that type of stuff, uh, the better it is. And I would love to see a little bit better of a job from the Packers on that side of things and the NFL of making it so that stuff is a little bit more accessible. All right, that brings us to our main topic for today. As you may have noticed, if you were paying attention to me on Twitter on Friday, What I did is I went through, there are 12 players. There are 12 players as I looked at the roster and I'm like, I barely know who these 12 players are. I know them because I'm supposed to know them. That's my job. But I have not gone prior to yesterday, prior to Friday. I've not gone and watched a ton of tape or most of these guys, any tape on these players, except for a couple here or there. Um, You know, I haven't done a ton of research into these players. These are players that were signed sort of out of nowhere in the middle of the season as a back of the roster practice squad guy. Uh, There's a a couple undrafted free agents or at least one undrafted free agent from a season ago. And, you know, there's, um, you know, guys that got picked up on futures contracts or things like that, where, especially in the middle of the season, you just, your, your, your focus is not set on breaking down a random back of the practice squad player in the middle of the season. There's too many things that are going on. So what I wanted to do as we are in the time frame where everyone and their mom is watching all of the draft prospects to see who could become a Green Bay Packer, there are a dozen players on the Green Bay Packers that we don't even know. We we have not, maybe you have, maybe you, a couple of you have looked at all these players in great detail, you know all their backstories, you know, and you've watched the tape. If so, Tip of the cap to you, this episode might not be for you. You might know all of it already. But my guess is if I barely know these dozen players, you probably barely know these dozen players. And really what my goal was through this entire process was, are there a couple hidden gems here? Are there a couple players that, all right, maybe I want to keep my eye on a little bit closer. So I went and personally watched their college tape. I watched their preseason NFL tape, and a couple of them have some actual NFL experience as well. Went through and watched that. Now, I'm not going to lie to you and tell you I spent hours upon hours of diving into, you know, Aaron Mosby's tape. I No, I did not do that. But I definitely took some time to go out and watch some of their stuff from college, some of their stuff from preseason, some of their stuff if they did have regular season stuff, and then just did my research on the players as well. It pretty much took me the vast majority of Friday to go through all of these players to bring you this episode today. So I'm going to go through these dozen players that you probably don't know or haven't heard of, or at least haven't researched. And we're going to go through, and I'm going to go in order of the least likely to be a gem for the Packer to the most likely. A couple players at the end of this list that did legitimately catch my eye. So let's start with number 12. Number 12 on this list is Jack Podlesny. 24-year-old kicker out of Georgia, was an undrafted free agent last uh, this past year in 2023. He's six foot, 195 pounds, In college, he went 60 of 73 on field goals, 182 out of 184 on extra points. But remember, college extra point is still that super easy extra point. He had an 83.9% field goal percentage his final season, was 9 of 17 uh, from 40 to 49 yards in his career, and 4 of 7 uh, on 50-yard field goals and above. 
Here was Lance Zerline's scouting report on Jack Podlesny coming out of college. Podlesny has kicked in some big games, but he missed two attempts in a narrow victory over Ohio State during last season's playoff semifinal. He also has a poor success rate on kicks from distance. Consistency and power are key, and Podlesny falls a little short in those areas. This is the one player I did actually go through and watch a few of his kicks, but I told you guys, like, I'm not going to watch kickers, punters, long snappers. It's not what I'm going to do. But he comes at number 12 on my list because he's currently the number three kicker on the roster. You've got Anders Carlson is still, to me, the odds-on favorite to make the team. And then you do have uh, Greg Joseph, who they just signed. And then comes Jack Podlesny. My guess is Jack Podlesny's days on the roster are probably numbered, probably not going to last too much longer, at least probably through the draft and undrafted free agency. But as long as he's still on the roster, I'm sure a lot of you have not spent a lot of time talking about, thinking about, watching Jack Podlesny. So there's a little bit of info on Jack Podlesny. Number 11, wide receiver, Thyric Pitts. Everyone's favorite, Thyric Pitts. It's a great name. Had an 8.72 relative athletic score coming out of college. 22 years old, still as of right now. Uh, All of these ages are what they are right now, not when they were coming out of college, but 22 years old right now. Out of the University of Delaware, was an undrafted free agent in 2023. He's 6'2", 201. In his college career, he had 172 catches, 2,429 yards, a 14.1 yard average, and 23 touchdowns. So had significant production throughout his college career. In his preseason in 2023, he had a 52.5 PFF grade on 83 snaps, played nine special team snaps with a 56.2 PFF grade, had 93% of his college snaps as a outside wide receiver, and had a 74.5 PFF run block grade in 2022 in his last year of college. Here was Zerline's scouting report on picks coming out of college. Perimeter receiver with the measurables and pro day testing to garner late round or priority free agent looks. Pitts has the ball skills teams are seeking at the position. He will need extensive route work to become a more elusive target and needs to play to the speed quickness he showed at his pro day. I could not echo those sentiments further. What I watched from him on tape is it lacked any sort of legitimate explosion. It's one thing if you have that 8.72 relative athletic score. It matters though if it shows up on tape. And this is sort of like the old adage of you don't count it twice when it shows up on tape and then they test well, you don't think anything of it. that. You, you expected them to be fast and then they were fast. Like Malik Neighbors is a great example of somebody where you watch him on tape, you know he's a speed demon. It's great that he tested a 4-3-40 or whatever it was at his pro day. It almost didn't matter. It just confirmed what you already knew, that he's a super freak, amazingly fast athlete. Thyric Pitts, when you're watching him on tape, you would assume that he was this slower wide receiver. But then he goes out and has a great day testing and and has an 8.72 relative athletic score, which doesn't match his tape, which then what happens is then you have to go back and watch his tape again and be like, all right, did I miss something? But his tape lacks any sort of real explosivity. I watched his tape from preseason. His route running, as Lance mentioned, is not there. A lot of slants and not a whole heck of a lot else. He has to develop something, anything that makes him stand out. Now, again, he did have good production in college. He does have good overall athleticism. He just needs to put that together a little bit further. It's not like unheard of that he's on the roster, but this would be one of those players that it's going to be brutal to try to make the roster already with all the young, talented wide receivers that are on this team. You got to figure that end of the draft or maybe even an undrafted free agency, they're going to bring in some guys. This is going to be a really tough roster it should go without saying for any sort of undrafted free agent that's not named Malik Heath uh, to make at this point. And uh, Thyric Pitts is going to probably find himself at the bottom of that wide receiver depth chart. So did not find any diamond in the rough here, but again, I can understand why he's on the roster and why you might want to try to cultivate some of that talent, but not somebody that I'm expecting to break out and all of a sudden make an impact for Green Bay. Number 10 on my list is the cornerback, Anthony Johnson, not the safety Anthony Johnson Jr., Yes, for those of you who don't know, they have two Anthony Johnsons on the team. He had a 4.80 relative athletic score, is 24 years old currently, out of the University of Virginia is where he played college, and he was an undrafted free agent this past year. He's got great size at corner at 6'2", 205. In fact, a lot of people expected him to play safety coming out of college. It would be too much, though, if Green Bay had two Anthony Johnsons at safety. Uh, I'm just kidding, but like he is a, he is a corner. They have him at corner, and I kind of understand why as well. And they did he did play corner in college as well. In 55 games, he had 27 starts, 
138 tackles, seven interceptions, three forced fumbles, and 38 passes defensed in his college career. In 2022, college quarterbacks were 31 of 60 when targeting him, a 10.3 yards per catch, two interceptions, and nine pass breakups. So he was very steady in coverage in 2022. In preseason in 2023, he only had 29 snaps with a 59.8 PFF grade. He had 124 uh, special teams uh, snaps in uh, 2023, and that was, uh, sorry, th- those were the defensive snaps. My apologies. 124 defensive snaps with a 57.7 grade, 29 special team snaps with a 59.8 grade, and then he had 328 college special team snaps. That's where he'd have to make his name first is on special teams. If he can do something on special teams, legitimately special, that would be his avenue to rate, uh, to making the roster as a corner. Uh, here was Zerline's scouting report coming out of college. Johnson's physical traits and natural footwork in phasing routes in space is very appealing, but certain athletic limitations could cause evaluators to pump the brakes when grading him. He can block a release from press or squeeze routes, breaks from his pedal or a side shuffle, but will struggle to keep pace with deep targets from man. Sticky hips make flat footed transitions and open field tackling challenging tasks for him. So teams will need to have a plan for optimizing his strengths while minimizing his limitations. In preseason, all of this showed up in glaring, obvious ways. He just did not have the fluidity as a corner that you would expect. And that's sometimes the issue that you get with taller, bigger corners, 6'2", 205, is they don't have that hip fluidity. They don't have the agility and change of direction ability. And that's what you saw with Anthony Johnson. There would be wide receivers, even in preseason, lesser wide receivers, that would make a sharp cut on a route, and Johnson just didn't have the ability to stick with it. I don't think that he has a future as an NFL corner, uh, I don't. I think he's going to struggle. This is again 328 college special team snaps. He's going to have to make his name on special teams. Does not have that high end athleticism. Only a 4.80 relative athletic score. There were a lot of people who thought he was going to be a late round pick this past season because there are things to like on tape and his production level in college was good. NFL wide receivers are just far too shifty. I don't think Johnson's going to be able to stick with them. And do not think that, like I said, Johnson has a. Uh, realistic uh, chance to help the Packers, even if he does make a roster long-term or something like that. It's always going to probably be a back-of-the-roster type of guy. By the way, I'm rooting for all these guys, of course. I hope all of these guys go on to be great and and find their, and, and be the diamond in the rough for Green Bay. But again, the, the, these we're realistic about these, right? These are back-of-the-roster guys. We're trying to see if maybe one or two of these guys can stand out. Number nine on my list is another corner. Corner Zion Gilbert, 8.77 relative athletic score, 25 years old currently, uh, went to college at Florida Atlantic University, was an undrafted free agent in 2022. He's six foot 193, actually did play in three games in 2022 in the regular season for the Giants, actually started a game in 2022 for the Giants, had 10 tackles that season, one tackle for loss, a sack. So he's a legitimate NFL sack of Jalen Hurts nonetheless. And uh, also has four special teams tackles in his career. In 2023, Gilbert had a 40.1 PFF grade in preseason on 42 snaps. In 2022, he had a 49.3 grade on 139 snaps. And then he had a 52.3 and 59.3 special teams grades uh, in both seasons on 57 total special team snaps. Here was Gilbert's scouting report from Tony Pauline. Gilbert was a feisty corner with a knack for defending passes, yet he has limitations. He possesses the style to be used in his own system, but must round off his game and add bulk to his thin frame. So this is somebody who originally showed up on Bruce Feldman's freaks list a while back, but he never really quite lived up to that. There were rumors that he ran like a 4-3-40 at his, you know, when he was earlier in college, but He doesn't show that athleticism on tape. He does have an 8.77 relative athletic score. So it's not like he's a bad athlete, but he's not like this super athlete. Like I said, he does have some NFL. He actually has an NFL start in his resume. And again, a sack on Jalen Hurts does have some special teams experience. Again, I didn't see the coverage ability here. As Tony Pauline mentioned, he could probably play a little bit in zone. I don't think he's a great fit for Jeff Halfley's defense. Uh, They played him in the slot a little bit in New York, which I think would probably be where Green Bay might need to play him a little bit more. But he has a long way to go from a technique standpoint and just from you know being able to help a, a team on any legitimate level. I don't think he's going to be a great special teams guy either, which just makes it really, really difficult. 
But um, right now, back of the roster type of player, we'll see what he can do in minicamp and OTAs and see if maybe he can take a step and get himself back on a 53-man roster. Number eight on my list, running back Ellis Merriweather, 5.48 relative athletic score. He's 24 years old, went to college at UMass, was an undrafted free agent just this past year. 6'1", 220 pounds. In his final season of college, he had 150 carries, 575 yards, 3.8 yard average. And uh, in 15 special team snaps this past season at a 44.8 grade in preseason and had 95 offensive snaps with the Saints in preseason with a 64.1 PFF grade. Tony Pauline's scouting report coming out of college. Merriweather comes with solid size as well as speed and offers possibilities as a short yardage ball carrier. However, he is a bit one dimensional. Here's the thing with Merriweather. He just lacks any sort of playmaking ability. You know, in, in college, earlier in college, he did have some plays uh, like over 10 yards and things like that. But you go back and watch him in preseason, you watch him in college, just a little bit more lumbering, lacks any sort of dynamic playmaking ability. He can catch the ball a little bit out of the backfield, but as Pauline mentioned, he's a little bit more one-dimensional. Like this is, I don't even know who to sort of compare him to. You know, if you're you're getting what's blocked for you, you're not breaking a ton of tackles. This is your back, again, back of the roster running back. I do think he can actually be a pretty good pass protector. He, to me, he he reminded me of a worse version of Patrick Taylor. So that just kind of tells you all you need to know, right? Patrick Taylor, who remains a free agent, at least as a recording of this podcast, he, to me, is a worse version of Patrick Taylor, is how I would define Ellis Merriweather. So no diamond in the rough there either. Number seven on my list. All these are current Green Bay Packers, remember. Safety Tyler Cole, 9.86 relative athletic score. He is 25 years old. Uh, played his last season of college at Purdue University. Was an undrafted free agent back in 2021, so he's been around a little bit. 6'1", 209 safety. He played three NFL games with the Cowboys, had six tackles and three special teams tackles. He played 392 career preseason snaps. His grades through his three seasons, 55-3, 56-1, and 69.5. The 69.5 was his rookie year, so he's actually kind of got worse as time has gone on. Has 107 career preseason special team snaps. This one, he has had a 48.5 grade, 75.8, and a 79.1. And he has 56 career regular special regular season special team snaps with a 59.4 and a 59.8 grade in those two seasons, respectively. Lance Erline scouting report, a team might fall in love with the combination of size, speed, and explosiveness, but it simply doesn't manifest itself enough on tape to buy all the way in. His issues digesting combo routes and his leggy transitions are serious concerns when tasked with man coverage duties. Coyle has the speed and athletic ability to range and make plays in the football, both downhill and over the top, but he only did that in one season. He appears to be a better tester than impact talent, but traits often earn players a longer look at the next level. Man, did Zerline crush that one out of the park because he is now in his, what, like third or fourth season? Fourth, third season, um, fourth season, sorry. And he's still around. He's still hanging around despite not having really any production on his career. Here's the the long and short of Tyler Coyle. Coyle doesn't have any real defensive value at this point, but I do think there is a potential real hidden gem as a special teams player. And that's why he's on the roster. This is sort of a Dallin Levitt type projection. And like, I'm not saying Dallin Levitt was any big impact, but I think if Tyler Coyle really focused on it, he could become a big time core special teamer with all that athleticism. And that's where he's going to have to make his name. He's been okay. He's better in preseason on special teams than he was in the regular season, but he does have, you know, 163 preseason and regular season special team snaps combined, but that that's what his focus needs to be. And like I said, I do think there's something there where they could cultivate that side of things. And if you get that, you know, maybe you get in a game and maybe you do something that gets your, uh, you know, gets attention on you or whatever, but he's going to have to really start and end his career as a core special teamer, in my opinion. Number six, defensive end DeAndre Johnson, 4.83 relative athletic score, 24 years old, University of Miami, also played for Tennessee, undrafted free agent in 2022, 6'3", 252, had 14 and a half college sacks and six forced fumbles. He had 10 preseason special team snaps this past year with a 59.2 grade, had a 56.6 preseason grade in 2022 on 39 snaps, had 222 career special team snaps in college. Now, Johnson, he's a pretty clean mover, um, has the ability to sort of uh, bend around the edge a little bit, spent some time in the XFL as well, spent some time with the Dolphins. 
uh, in preseason this past year. He's got some fun plays on tape. This is another one where special teams are going to be super important to him. I think he at least has some value there. And he did flash some playmaking ability on the edge. This is a probably at best very back of the you know practice squad roster, maybe 14th, 15th, 16th guy. Uh, again, only 24 years old, so maybe still has some upside ahead of him. I liked his movement ability overall. And he had a, he had a couple of nice plays, one in the run game. And then he had a really nice play in college too that I posted on Twitter if you want to go out and look at that. But yeah, this is just, a, again, maybe a developmental defensive end. Don't see a ton of upside here. But I did like some of his plays on tape and I did like his overall agility and movability. I was, I was intrigued, if nothing else. But again, probably back of the roster practice squad type of guy at best here. All right, number six, or excuse me, number five, on my list is Deslin Alexander. Now we're starting to get to some guys that at least I had some level of intrigue with. Deslin Alexander, 8.39 relative athletic score, 25 years old, played uh, college football at Pitt, undrafted free agent in 2023, 6'3", 264, had 131 tackles, 16 and a half sacks, eight passes defensed, and two forced fumbles in his career at Pitt. Had a 63.8 PFF grade and 109 preseason snaps this past year and had 320 career special team snaps in college. Here was Lance Zerline's scouting report on Alexander. Alexander is an edge defender who relies on his broad frame and natural power. He's long and naturally heavy handed, but you will need to play with much better bend to improve his ability to hold the point against the run. While he's a segmented mover at times, he does have quick feet and shows decent pursuit, quickness, and motor. He's a face-up rusher who is unlikely to beat NFL opponents with crafty moves and counters, so fortifying his power rush will be critical as a day three possibility for 4-3 defenses. So I do think that Alexander fits very well as a 4-3 defensive end. I do think he has actually some ability to kick inside as well. I was impressed with his athleticism. He's got a pretty good motor. He had a great couple great plays on tape where he ran plays down and made big hits on the play. One was a sack. I think one was a stopped run, if I remember correctly. But um, he does have that at his disposal as well. I thought that the the speed to power stuff the is exactly where he needs to win. He's a bigger guy, 264 pounds as a defensive end. You, know, you go back to some of these other guys. Uh, we'll talk about Aaron Mosby and Keyshawn Banks there in the 250s. DeAndre Johnson was 250. Alexander's got 12 pounds on those guys, and it shows. He is a big dude. I do think he can get better at setting the edge, but I think he has the ability to be that. He was an intriguing player when you watched him. Like there, there's a little something there. There's a little something there that if if something just hits right or he gets an opportunity, I'd be very intrigued. Um, this is a player that if he makes it to preseason, I'm just gonna kind of keep an extra eye out uh, to see what he can do and if if he can get his name in any sort of conversation or at least on a, a practice squad. But I, I like Deslin Alexander. Uh, the plays that I posted were really, really fun of him. And again, he had a great chase down and just absolutely obliterated uh, a quarterback, but had some wins along the defensive front as well. And uh, like I said, I want to keep my eye on him. Number four on my list, Joel Wilson, tight end, only a 4.33 relative athletic score, 23 years old out of central Michigan, undrafted free agent in 2023. He's got good size though, 6'4", 242. In college, he had 82 catches for 874 yards and 12 touchdowns, which is great. 85 preseason snaps this past year with only a 45.9 grade for the Bills, had 31 special team snaps also with a 45.9 grade, and then had only 53 career special team snaps in college. A couple things that'll hold Wilson back. One is he's not a great blocker as of right now, and two, he doesn't have that special teams value. Uh, But I did think he did a really nice job in the passing game. He made some ridiculous catches. As we mentioned, had 12 touchdowns over 10 yards per reception. There was stuff to like there. And I do think he has potentially some H back, maybe a little fullback in him as well. I think he can be a little bit of a move piece. There was a little bit, they're not apples to apples comparisons as players, but there was a little bit like when I watched him, I'm like, he could have a Robert Tunyon-esque trajectory where he comes completely out of nowhere, takes a step and develops into a solid tight end. I could easily see that happening with a player like Joe Wilson. Here was Zerline's scouting report on Wilson. Wilson doesn't have the play strength or technique of a wide tight end and might not have the speed to threaten the seam as a pass catching option, but it is still easy to like his game. He's clever as a route runner and shows an ability to create separation with decent success underneath, but he must become even more, uh, more competitive on contested catches. 
Wilson's run blocking needs work, but he's willing and will have potential in that area if he can get much stronger. So this is an issue of, can you get a little bit quicker? Can you put on a little bit more functional strength? And can you start putting your overall game together? But there's something there. There's a little something there that I think, you know, could cultivate itself into a number three, number four tight end. And actually on a 53 man roster, if things hit correctly, but that was a player where you watch, he made this ridiculous high catch. He made a diving catch on a play. That was another ridiculous one. Uh, again, those 12 touchdowns are a couple that were really great uh, where he fought through contact to get into the end zone. There's a lot to like about Joe Wilson, exactly like Zerline said. And I, like I said, I think you could end up being a back of the roster type of player at some point if things hit in the right way. Number three on my list is defensive end slash off-ball linebacker Aaron Mosby, a 4.22 relative athletic score, 24 years old out of Fresno State, undrafted free agent in 2022. He's 6'3", 250. He has appeared in three regular season game for, games for the Panthers, had a 44.2 grade on 45 snaps, 65.1 grade on 31 special team snaps, but did have 547 college special team snaps. Interesting about Mosby. Uh, he has been in between off-ball linebacker and edge rusher like his entire career. If I had to guess, my guess is Green Bay moves him back to off-ball linebacker. There's not a lot of space at edge, and I do think that Green Bay needs more bodies at that off-ball linebacker. So maybe Mosby can get back to playing that, maybe drop a little bit of weight, maybe play a little bit quicker, because right now carrying that 250 pounds as an off-ball linebacker is tough, but maybe he could be one of those physical off-ball linebackers. Here was Tony Pauline's scouting report, and it's interesting to sort of go over if they do move him to off-ball linebacker. Early in his Fresno State career, Mosby looked like a terrific off-the-ball linebacker displaying a variety of skill. Used primarily over tackle in Fresno's 3-4 scheme last season, he looked out of sorts and was not as productive as expected. Mosby is a natural 4-3 defender who could add depth to a team's linebacker unit if he gets his game back on track. That's exactly what we're looking for. Somebody who has the ability to maybe play that off-ball linebacker who early in his college career played it well. They tried to move him to edge. It didn't work out. Now can you move him back to off-ball linebacker, have him drop some weight, pick up some speed, and can he be even better? That's what I think Green Bay has to look at. I do think moving him back to that spot and asking him to drop weight is probably what's best for both Mosby and the Packers. And we'll see if he can get his name in the conversation. The nice thing about Mosby though, is the more you can do the better, right? 547 career special team snaps. This is somebody that would project as a core special teamer, somebody that's got off-ball linebacker and defensive end versatility. There's, there's value there. Can he crack the roster? Tough to say, but that's somebody that you maybe keep along on your special teams and call up in case of emergency, either as a core special teamer, a defensive end, or an off-ball linebacker. Number two on my list, Keyshawn Banks, defensive end, only a 2.15 relative athletic score, 24 years old out of San Diego State, undrafted free agent in 2023, 6'3", 251, 139 tackles, 42 tackles for loss, 13 sacks, 43 hurries, a fumble forced, and a fumble recovered in his college career. He had a 32.9 grade on 22 special team snaps. Here's the big thing for Banks. He is not a special teams guy at all. He has to make his living on the defense because he's probably not going to become a good special teamer. Now, he had 72 snaps for the Packers last year in preseason, had an 81.3 grade. One of the great things about Banks is he's a really good run defender, and he's got it very stout at the point of attack. That 251-pound frame serves him well at 6'3". He's able to get into the backfield. But he also holds his point of attack too, sets the edge. I liked what he did there. Here was Tony Pauline's scouting report. Banks is a hardworking defender who does the little things well. He possesses a thin build. I think Banks has actually added weight since then uh, and must fill out his frame. Yet Franks comes with, uh, or excuse me, that Banks comes with upside. So that's where we're at with Keyshawn Banks. You go back, there's some really fun snaps of him in preseason last year. Had a great uh, run stop behind the line of scrimmage. He had a couple of nice pass rush sets. And by the way, actually had one play that he got in the game of all games in the divisional round game against the 49ers. He actually played two games, but one of them was a kneel down at the end of the game. But he did play one defensive snap, held up well at the point of attack in the running game. There's some good stuff there for Keyshawn Banks. Is probably one of your practice squad guys that if you had to call up for a game day and play him 10, 12 snaps, you wouldn't be upset about it. And he had a really nice preseason for Green Bay just a season ago. And then last but not least, number one on my list is linebacker 
Christian Young, 4.04 relative athletic score, 23 years old out of Arizona, undrafted free agent in 2023, 6'1", 221, 182 tackles, 9 tackles for loss, 11 passes defended, 2 forced fumbles, 3 fumble recoveries in college, had a 56.0 PFF grade and 61 defensive snaps in preseason last year, had a 66.7 PFF grade on 25 special team snaps in preseason last year, did have 413 college special team snaps, which is huge. For Lance Zerline, height, weight, speed prospect, lacking the football awareness and overall technique needed to step onto an NFL field at this time. Young has the frame to play as a box safety or potentially move to a will linebacker role, but he must improve his tackling. He has special teams potential, so that could work for him if he gets into a camp. He does have that special teams potential, but I like him a lot better at linebacker now that he's been moved to linebacker full-time than at safety. He's never going to fit at safety, but I think if he puts on a little bit of functional strength this offseason, he's a really fun player. There's a couple of plays on tape where he is screaming to the football and making big hits, going from middle linebacker all the way to the sideline and clearing things out. He's got skill. He legitimately has skill. Add into it the special team's value. Add into it an off-ball linebacker group that is in need of bodies. Add into it the fact that he's got that safety background. He was a safety in college. Has some of those coverage skills as a linebacker. This, to me, is the one to keep an eye on. Somebody that I think does legitimately have a chance to make at minimum a practice squad. And maybe, if you if you told me one of these players made a 53-man roster, I'd be putting my money on Christian Young. And again, I do think he has the potential to be a core special teamer as well. Overall, we went through 12 players. Christian Young, Keyshawn Banks, Aaron Mosby, Joel Wilson, Deslin Alexander, DeAndre Johnson, Tyler Cole, Ellis Merriweather, Zion Gilbert, Anthony Johnson, Thyric Pitts, and Jack Podlesny. Overall, not a great group of players. And I don't mean that as a disrespect. We know that they're like the, you know, on the 90-man roster, these are the guys that are going to be like somewhere in the 70 to 90 range, right? But you were hoping to see, I was hoping to see a couple of players that caught my eye. I thought... Joel Wilson at tight end and Christian Young at linebacker were very intriguing and have some potential upside long-term. I thought Aaron Mosby and Keyshawn Banks are solid practice squad options who could play in a pinch and you wouldn't be too upset about, especially Mosby, you know, being active on game day and being somebody that can do a lot of special teams, can play some defensive end, can play some off-ball linebacker. That versatility would be huge for him. I think Tyler Cole is a player who could still develop potentially into a core special teams player. But all those guys are going to have a really difficult time making a roster. It's a very, uh, it's not a deep team, I wouldn't say, but it's getting deeper. And certainly when you add 11 draft picks and some undrafted free agents to that list, it's going to get even harder. But Christian Young, Keyshawn Banks, Aaron Mosby, Joel Wilson, guys I like, and maybe, maybe, just maybe one or two of those guys can actually make it along the 53-man roster. All right, friends, that is going to do it for me today. I'll be right back here tomorrow with you with an all-new episode. If you stuck along, for 12 of these players that most of us have never heard of, that many could get cut at any given moment, you are the nerds nerds that I am just absolutely in love with. This is the audience we want to cultivate here is just going over these conversations that nobody else is having. Nobody's talking about the back of the roster players and who might have an actual chance to make the team, but this is the stuff that I love doing. Maybe this episode was more for me, but I wanted to take a look at these guys and give them a chance and put them on tape and see, all right, is there, is there something there? Can they, can one of these guys really pan out? I didn't necessarily see it uh, with a lot of them, but a couple guys that, like I said, keep an eye on and see if maybe just if one of the 12 could develop into the back of the roster guy, that would be a win for Green Bay, meaning a back of the 53. You would take that. All right, shout out to Most State of Minnesota and PJ Wynn, John Wild, Chibra Dad, Brandon Paletta, Jennifer Wright, Boom Handle, Donald Lee, Lori Lord, Baby QB, David McCluskey, Donald Decker, Bremen, David Prendergast, and Dan Miller. Appreciate you guys a ton. I'll see you tomorrow. But until next time, and as always, go pack go.